outside. So we will hear from Lauren Warren, Thank you for joining. Uh, so tonight's conversation is about the Supreme Court and the dynamics of the Supreme Court. And we have our special guest tonight, Lando Sparkman Ford. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Larry's here. Hi. Uh, Thank right? Sure. Uh, so when Larry helped me put together a, a well-known uh, group of educators to help us sort of grapple with a lot of these issues and, and topics, and it's been a great way to really, really learn what we know. And um, tonight, I think you're going to be really surprised and engaged in the presentation. And the way this works is uh, we use the comment section below. So you can put your comments in there. And if you can't formulate a question, because sometimes you just can't get the question figured out, if there's an area that you're interested in or, or a time period or something, like that, just flash that in there too. And our facilitator here, Larry, is always really good at forming a question and, and we'll get the conversation moved in that direction. So I hope you can engage with us and enjoy uh, our conversation. Uh, so, Larry, we got some other business to take care of. Yeah. As a matter of my pay, you said $15,000. Oh. No. Okay, so no donations in. Yeah. Sure. We have one more topic. Oh, we two weeks on the 3rd of March with me and Keith Falkman, who we've met before, and we're going to speak and highlight four presidents and five impeachments. And we're going to talk about presidential impeachments, not just the week of recent one. We'll go back further and answer your questions and address your issues chat. Okay. So that's finally and going to be really interesting. I hope so. So that's going to be March 3rd. Uh, uh, if you have a question, you can email on the same site. So we'll feel free to answer that. Um, also, we have a great picture here. So if you're here, we'll answer questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My pleasure to introduce my partner tonight, my, my friend and my colleague, uh, Rick Hardy, uh, former professor of science. I met him first when we were department chairs in the Arts Department at Morgan Hall. Um, he's been the dean of the Centennial Honors College, and maybe most importantly, we were bandmates for six years. We played in the band all the years, Larry. Right? What the name? It just seems like six. It just seems like six. Rick was a leader. Rick was a leader. Rick was a leader. And we had a great time. Best time. Among the best times in my life. Okay, so we're going to start the discussion. I'll have to go with a conversation. And feel free to break into the questions you got. Let's see those. Sue will raise her hand. And we'll start the discussion. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Larry for being here. And I'd like to thank you for your presentation. Thank you for being here. 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 Established the Constitution and the uh, judicial section is a separate article. In some ways, the least specific of the articles. What do you think the founding fathers thought the Supreme Court would be able to do? Great question, Larry. First of all, I want to say thank you for having me. Uh, you're uh, a legend at Western Illinois University. And, uh, a wealth of information, and I often come to you for material, so thank you very much. Uh, I think we have to look back at why they met in Philadelphia uh, in 1787. Uh, we were under, after the Declaration of Independence, as you recall, we were under a government called the Articles of Confederation. And each state was a sovereign state. Now, a lot of people get confused over this. If you're an international student, you know what's next. Illinois is a state. That can't be a state. Mexico is a state. state. Israel, Israel is a state. state. Nigeria, Nigeria is a state. But why do you why call you a state? state? Well, because, because after, after the Declaration of Independence, all, all the 13 colonies declared themselves independent states. states. They had sovereignty, control of their own internal affairs. affairs. And uh, it worked maybe a little bit, but it was, uh, it was a recipe for disaster. Each state could coin their own money. Each state could uh, negotiate treaties with the foreign nations. And the Native there. Americans. Um, there was no way to control piracy off the high, in the high seas. It was just absolutely the problem were legion. And uh, the Continental Congress, under the Articles of Confederation, uh, were, they realized it was falling apart. Uh, they, it wasn't going to sustain itself. So they called for delegates to the, go to the convention. One of the problems, Larry, is uh, that they didn't have under the Articles an executive, a designated executive. It was just the Congress. Now, there was a court 
but it can only handle prize cases and very limited uh, jurisdiction. So, in, if, if, so you just had a one, a, a one um, branch, a one branch government. All right, and it wasn't working. So when they met in Philadelphia, they met for the, quote, sole and express purpose of revising the articles. They had no intention of revising the articles. They decided they were going to just kill it and start it anew. And, uh, and, and fortunately, somebody came to the table with a plan. His name was James Madison. He was, an ast- he was, a, 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 he was a profound reader and scholar. A man wasn't very tall. He was about five foot three, maybe weighed a buck twenty. Uh, but he was a man who was giant in terms of intellect. And he came with a plan called the Virginia Plan. And it was based upon some of the things that he had read. And among other things, he had read Montesquieu. Uh, it was written in 1748. It was called The Spirit of the Laws. And he realized that, well, as he said in the Federalist Papers later, uh, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. But you had to tie people down. And the checks and balances were the to do it. So they saw a need to have uh, an independent judiciary and a a fairly strong president because they didn't have that. Uh, So it was glaring weaknesses. So when they carved this out, uh, if you'll notice in the Constitution, I think you have a copy there, the longest section is is of the legislative branch. Yes. Uh, the next longest is of the executive branch, and then when they get to the judicial branch, it's much smaller. Uh, incidentally, I know a lot of people say, uh, Constitution, I can't read that. Well, the Constitution altogether is about 7,606 words long. That's actually yes. actually count. <laughs> and uh, if you read the uh, Chicago Tribune sports section today, you'll have read more words than are in the United States Constitution. It's, it's meant to be a, a framework upon which it's built. So it begins with the preamble, we the people of the United States, in order to form this more perfect union. Incidentally, that's a lofty statement that has never been used as a Supreme Court decision. My bad. And then Article 1 begins, All legislative power herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. Representatives. Article 2 begins, The executive power shall be vested in a President of the United States. And then list his powers. And then Article 3, what we're dealing with tonight, begins, the judicial power shall be vested in one Supreme Court and such inferior courts as Congress shall from time to time ordain and establish. So there's only one court called for in the Constitution. It doesn't say its size. It says there shall be one Supreme Court. And then he leave it up to Congress to determine, other than the original jurisdiction. So that's where we have it. But it was needed because there was no way to, to deal with uh, conflicts and resolve them under the Articles. So you've got a Supreme Court Chief Justice. Yes. Appointed by the President, approved by the Senate. Mm-hmm. And then you have what the Judicial Act of 1789 sets the court at five Associate Justices and a Supreme Court Chief oh, Justice. well stated. When Congress first met in New York City, which was our nation's capital, the first order of business really uh, was to establish a, a judicial system. And as you mentioned, they passed the Federal Judiciary Act of 1789. And this set up the size of the court. Note again, there's nothing in the Constitution about the size or how many members are on the Supreme Court. So they decided there would be one chief justice. Technically, he's called the chief justice of the United States. Yes, he is. Right. Not the chief justice of the Supreme Court. And then they said there are going to be five associate justices. And then they set up the, uh, 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 the appellate jurisdiction, that is, the courts below that, federal courts, that would handle cases as it came up. So there were 13 originally, were there not? Yeah. One, apparently one for each state. One for each state. But that had to be changed a little bit because they, they initially had circuits that they went on. Yeah. And... Uh, you had six justices divided up into three major circuits. You had an Eastern Circuit, which was New York, uh, um, uh, you know, the area there. New and Jersey. New yep. Jersey, okay. And then they had uh, the um, uh, another circuit for the South, and then a separate one for the middle states, as they called them. Now, when we talk about circuit, that literally means that about half the year, a justice of the Supreme Court was riding around physically, in that geographic circuit, oh. hearing cases, 
at a lower court level. Most people don't understand that, but you're absolutely right to bring that up. Um, when it was set up, the justices of the court were supposed to meet in the nation's capital twice a year. And then when they weren't in the nation's capital, they were to ride circuit. As you said, they got on horseback, or they might have been horse and buggy, yeah. and they would ride their circuit. And then they would come back. The problem was that they came back to the nation's capital, which is New York City, and then later became Philadelphia, and later Washington, D.C. It was in the dead of winter, right? Um, and then they would ride their circuit. Can you imagine some of the early justices in the Southern Circuit that would, their circuit would be 1,800 miles, and you wouldn't get on a regular road and ride it. You had to forge streams. You, if you got hungry, you couldn't stop at McDonald's. No. You had to find some place to eat, and they fe- frequently had to board in boarding homes, and they had to sleep with people they didn't even know in a, in a strange bed, all right? It was a weird operation, and many of them just couldn't take it, and they hated it. And I might add, what's the... Uh, implication here is they go out and hear cases and then they go back to the nation's capital and then have to decide the cases they've already heard. Yeah. If it's an, if they were at that, if they, if they hear a circuit court case right. and that's appealed to the Supreme yeah. court, they hear that same course. Again. They hear there's, it no again. Double, there's no double they, jeopardy. There's no, du- well, there's no, uh, well, they should perhaps that's recuse not, that's themselves. Not the yeah. 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 There's a conflict of interest, but they didn't see it that way. And right? Supreme court justices rode circuit till 1891. Um, uh, in the 1890s, yeah, yeah, there was a deal cut. Yeah, they tried to end it in in 1800, but uh, it didn't go. There was a, a deal gone bad, and they said we're going to keep them in the in the circuit. So it was a sore point with a lot of the justices. They just didn't like it. In fact, uh, some of the uh, there were several justices that had gout so bad they couldn't get on a horse, yeah. right? Or their backs were thrown, and many of them were rather corpulent individuals, right? And, I read uh, somewhere where where Chief Justice Tony broke. A collarbone mm-hmm. in, a, in a road accident riding yeah. circuit. Um, so, I mean, he was, I mean, they didn't get extra money for this. Well, Tony had a good circuit because he was in Maryland, yes. his hometown. Right? So he his got mo- Maryland, Virginia, and, and, Delaware. And probably, yeah. I'm not sure if it was Pennsylvania, but he was in an in a approximate area where he lived. So he didn't have to go very far. But he had he had it relatively easy compared to the other ones. And, then, and the, uh, the number of Supreme Court justices, including the chief justice, has been set at nine since like 1870, something like that. Uh, 1869. 69. Uh, they've been uh, set at nine. Larry, over the years, uh, they've changed the size. Originally, it was six. Then it went down to five. Then it went back to six. Then it went to seven. Went to nine. And then and it went to ten for a while when they wanted to bring California into. Yeah. And I think Justice Field might have made the tenth one. I yeah, could be wrong. He, he was the 10th one. Yeah, he was the 10th. And then after, in 1869, after the Civil War, they went back to nine and have kept there. And a lot of people think, uh, Larry, that this is uh, uh, put in stone or something. It really isn't. I know we're talking about, people talking about enlarging the court, uh, but it's they see it's sacrosanct to talk about enlarging the court. There's something sacred about nine. Well, there really isn't. Uh, it It's just the way it's been for a hundred years Long or time. longer, and yeah. uh, and they've kept it that way. Okay, now let's let's talk a little bit about some of the crucial decisions, some sure. of the some of the justices, and so forth. Some of the issues. We we came up with a kind of list, did we not? That yeah. that she has there, which she can show at her leisure, of what we sort of think are the most important Supreme Court decisions. Now let's we start. I would start with Marbury versus Madison with. Maybe the most interesting Supreme Court Chief Justice of them all, Roger B. Tawney. Yeah. He's actually the fourth Chief Justice. Is that right? Uh, well, uh, John Marshall is the fourth Chief I'm sorry, Chief who did I just say, yeah. Tawney? Tawney Marshall. was the, I'm he sorry, replaced John, Tawney. John in, Marshall. Yeah, in, in uh, 1834, 1835. Yeah. No, Marshall becomes Chief Justice in 1801. He's the fourth Justice. That's right. And uh, what you have, and a lot of people, by the way, when you go to the Supreme Court building and you if, if visit there, you'll see this huge statue is called the Chief Justice, right? And it's always been John Marshall. But a lot of people have a misnomer that he was the first Chief Justice. That was John Jay. John Jay. And he left, uh, he was hanged in effigy, and he left town, and he, he left the Supreme Court to go back and become the governor of New York. He, he It was just an ignominious ending uh, of his uh, judicial career. But uh, John Marshall is the key. Um, 
why is he important? Um, well, there was a case in 1803 called Marbury versus Madison. And uh, it's, it's a complicated case. And by the way, uh, if you were in law school, you might spend up to two weeks on this case. Uh, we don't have that time. No, uh, so we're, we're going to see if we can do it real quickly. But here, here's essentially it. Uh, the election of 1800 was the first year in which we had political parties. And John Adams was defeated by Thomas Jefferson. And John Adams and the Federalist Party controlled both houses of Congress, and they controlled, obviously, the White House, right? And um, Thomas Jefferson was coming in, a bitter rival, bitter enemy of, uh, political enemy of, of Adams, John Adams. Now, in those days, when you got defeated in November, you would still stay on until, uh, until March, March 3rd, 3rd yeah. or 4th because that was needed for transportation. That was ended with the 20th Amendment, and we've changed that. But uh, they had time for mischief, and they feared what Jefferson was going to do. So what they did was they created a new uh, Federal Judiciary Act, 1801. And what it called for was adding 49 new judgeships. And so when they added the judgeships, of course, they were going to pack the court. With Federalists. With Federalists, absolutely because they didn't trust Thomas Jefferson. Well, Thomas Jefferson, of course, was livid. He was sitting back there and saying, what are you doing? You've just taken away the judiciary and, what, uh, and you've left me with nothing. And they were livid about this. Well, uh, one, of the things that, one, uh, one of the things that's quite ironic is the Secretary of State was John Marshall. He was a Federalist under Adams. And he got appointed to be the new Chief Justice of the United States Replacing the uh, uh, replacing uh, would it be Oliver Ellsworth. Oliver right? Ellsworth. No, no, it would have been yeah. Uh, so when he left the court, all right, um, what he uh, uh, did was he had two jobs at the same time. Now we wouldn't tolerate that today. He's Secretary of State and Chief Justice at the same time. Well, it was up to the in those days the Secretary of State to deliver the commissions. So they were they were approved by Congress. They were nominated and approved by President Adams, and then it had to have the official seal attached to them, and that was the role of Secretary of State. Well, it was up to Adam. It was up to uh, it was, excuse me. Uh, you know, it was up to Marshall to get that job done. He was so pressed for time, he he got forty two of them done, and he left it up to his brother James to deliver the rest. Stories was that he stopped off at the tavern a few times, and he didn't get the commissions delivered. So it strikes at noon on the 4th of March, and a new president comes in. And there are, there are uh, seven commissions that weren't filled. One of those was to be the, um, uh, chief, uh, be the Justice of Peace of, of Washington, D.C. And he had appointed, Adams had, had appointed William Marbury. Marbury. All right. Now, what William Marbury says, hey, where's my commission? Uh, Madison comes, uh, 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 Jefferson comes in, and his new Secretary of State is none other than James Madison. He says, Madison, don't deliver those. You don't deliver those. He says, do not give those commissions out. Well, William Marbury then looks at it, and under the Federal Judiciary Act of 1789, it authorized the president, it authorized the Supreme Court to issue a writ of mandamus. A writ of mandamus is a court order compelling a government official to fulfill his or her duty, right? So he, ish, he, he applies for a writ of mandamus before the U.S. Supreme Court. So we have, uh, and he sues none other than James Madison. So we have, it gets complicated, doesn't it? Madison, so Will Marbury is suing Madison, Madison, the new Secretary of State, asking him to, to, demanding that he be delivered the commission and asking the Supreme Court to issue that writ of mandamus. Now you have the new Chief Justice. His name is John Marshall. And he's between a rock and a hard place because he knows that if he orders Madison to deliver it, Madison won't do it. And on top of it, he'll be impeached because the new Congress, the new Senate, is Republican. Everybody's re everybody is a Republican, it's Democratic Jeffersonian Republican, Republican, Jeffersonian Republican. Yeah. He's going to be impeached. But if he lets Madison get away with it, it says the Supreme Court is feckless. It, it's, it's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. So the artful dodger that he was, and he was never a very good jurist, so to speak, a, a lawyer, but he came up with a unique plan. He says, 
so the question is, is, is William Marbury entitled to that judgeship? He said, yes. Um, uh, he said, it was signed, it was approved by the Congress, it was signed by President Adams, and it was sealed, but it wasn't delivered. However, he said, we can't make a ruling on this because we have no authority to issue a writ of mandamus. When Congress created the Federal Judiciary Act, Judiciary Act of 79, it enlarged the Supreme Court what was called beyond what was called for in the Constitution. Supreme Court outlines the original jurisdiction. A writ of mandamus is a creation by the by the Congress, not by this by the by the by the Constitution. So therefore, even though he's entitled to this position, we cannot rule on it because that law, which is contrary, a law passed by the Congress, which is contrary to the fundamental document, the Constitution, has to be rendered null and void. Therefore, he sets up what is called judicial review. It's the power of the court to render a decision of the other branch of government unconstitutional. So uh, in that sense, he sets up something. Now, the next time, do you know when the next time he used judicial review? Uh, well, was it McCulloch versus Maryland? No, no, no. It was Dred Scott. Of course. And so they Act went until 1857 before they rendered. Now, there were a lot of people who were critical of this. Now, think about this. No other court in the history of the world ever had the authority to declare the acts of the other two branches unconstitutional. This is purely an American invention. Um, Judge Gibson of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in a, in a state case uh, many years ago, uh, Aiken versus Robb, wrote probably the best disquisition. In, the, in law school, you'd study this for a week. He said, the role of the court in the British legal system is to interpret the Constitution. Does this law comport with the Constitution or not? That's all you have to do. It does or it doesn't. And then you leave it there. That's a judicial decision. But when you kill something and declare it unconstitutional, it's a political decision. And he says that essentially that the job of the court is to interpret the law, not to get involved in politics. Because if you declare something unconstitutional, in order to overturn it, would take a constitutional amendment, which is an extra majority. Yeah. And he says, judges are fallible just like, just like members of the court and just like presidents. And so the best thing to do is say, it doesn't comport with the Constitution and leave it up to Congress. To fix it. And if Congress doesn't fix it, then the voters can throw them out of office. That assumes that the voters know what they're doing, yeah. what the people in Congress are doing, which is, which is a fallacious assumption. But that established judicial review. And since that time, I would guess, Larry, we probably had maybe 115 or 16 cases Federal laws struck down and and presidential enactments, presidential action, and over a thousand yeah. state ones. A yeah. thousand state laws have been declared unconstitutional. It is an American invention. Uh, the British don't follow this. We we are one of the few people, few nations in the world that has even attempted this. And it's amazing how it's worked. So the only way to re reverse a decision by the court like that is either. A new court looks at the same issue again and reverses exactly. it, they can, or you change they the Constitution. Uh, and, or you change the Constitution. And they've been leery of ever tackling a judicial review. Why would a court want to do that? They've got power that nobody else has. Yeah. That, that's a great uh, That's a great thing. That goes and with yet it's interesting, is it not, that, that the judicial process, the Supreme Court, is the creation of the president who appoints them and the Senate which approves them. So the other two branches really are the kind of caretakers of who goes on the court. Yeah. And yet the court exerts itself under Marshall here. And all of his successors agree with the idea of judicial review. Sure. So they can act, you can null and void, or you can approve an action of Congress or the president right. or state government now, or state court. Now, for the most part throughout history, the court has gone along with the president. Yep. The most part, they've gone along with the with the court, with the, with the Congress. But there have been times they've been at loggers. And usually when it's one political party, the other. And there's there's a, a realigning election where you have an influx of new people passing new laws, and the old guard is still in in the in the um, lifetime appointments. Yeah, let's let's let me let's define some terms. Sure. Go define again. Writ of mandamus. A writ of mandamus uh, goes back to the British common law. It was simply a, a a court order compelling a government official to do a job. For example, 
you have that here in, in, in Illinois. If you had a, let's say a sheriff who refuses to enforce uh, something, you can go to court and, and ask to... the court to issue a writ of mandamus to compel that sheriff to do his job or her job. All right. Writ of certiorari. Is that is certiorari that... to make more certain? And that's been a fairly, it's been around for years, but it's the only way today, really, you get a case before the Supreme Court. Unless it's a, one state suing another, that's an original jurisdiction. Yeah. But today, about the only way you get a court case before it, because of judicial changes. There used to be lots of different ways to get uh, to court. A writ of error, if somebody made an error, a judge yeah. made an error, yeah. you get to court. Yeah. Uh, they used to have something called writ of appeal, uh, where let's say you had one circuit court rule and runway on a case and a very similar case in another circuit, and they don't match up, the court would take that by appeal. All right. Today, they don't do that. The only way you're going to get it is by writ of certiorari. Certiorari, a law professor used to tell me. Yes. And it, it really is to make more certain. And it's a court order from the Supreme Court to a lower court ordering the records be brought up to make more certain as to what. You're not going to re redo the facts. You can't do that. You review the process and the, and the, and the application of the law. And it takes only four justices to do that. Only four. Any four of the nine, if they vote for it, it brings it up. How about uh, ex parte? Ex parte, on behalf of one, is what it means. Doesn't and, that always mean, almost always mean a, a what am I thinking of, a cabeus corpus kind of case? Uh, they're often, you're absolutely right. And yeah. you, you remember during the Civil War, yeah. ex parte Merriman, ex parte Milligan. McArdle, uh, they, they especially used that then because they were uh, d d d d dealt with, uh, with that. But it, um, those are just some terms you use, yeah. uh, and um, and uh, interesting to note that um, there are about ten thousand cases that are tr app appealed to the Supreme Court a year. About ten thousand cases. They're only going to take about eighty cases, and it's a rule of four, any four. And and today I'll show you how they do it. Uh, they usually take those cases and they give them to their law clerks. Each one has three to four law clerks. Fresh out of law school, uh, usually high-end law school. I Do mean, the usually individual justices choose their own law They clerks? choose their own. They interview for them. These students apply for it. And some members of the court, like Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, um, 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 the new Roberts, Robert they, were all, uh, law they were all law clerks, right? And so it, they kind of pick their own. I mean, it's, it's kind of a nice system they have worked up. Most of them are almost all I league. There was a student picked by, by Rehnquist from the University of Missouri Law School. Ah, it was one of the rarest of all things. You should get. know that I went to the University of Missouri and got my degrees there, and Rick was a faculty member at the yeah, University right. of Missouri. Yeah, that's right. So we, we have that, we have that in common. common. Well, anyway, getting back to this. So the law clerks pour over these cases, and they make synopsis. And then they bring them. They're called discuss lists. And they bring them to the justices. And the justices look it over, and if they think it's worthy, they'll select it. They bring it to the justice they work for, or they bring it no, to they, all they, the justices? They'll bring it to all of them, all right? They summarize them. That's the power. Uh, I read uh, one, one of the great books I read uh, on uh, the court. Uh, uh, Rehnquist talked about when he was a law clerk for Robert Jackson. And he said nobody told him what to do. He got there, and he says, go to work. And the first thing they had to do was summarize a case, and he realized the power of, of, uh, of a of the summary. Yeah. And and so uh, they look at that. Now, there are times, Larry, um, when justices, for example, the activist judge uh, like um, Earl Warren, uh, he told his law clerks, look for a particular case. That's how he got Gideon versus Wainwright. Mm -hmm. It was a handwritten appeal uh, in form of pauperous. That means in the form of a, a pauper. It was a ta he wrote it on with pencil and a tablet paper, right? And they were looking for something in order to change the ap application of the of the Sixth Amendment right to counsel. So sometimes there's got to be some scheming done there, right? Look for a particular case. Now, they'll never admit it, but you can't help but noticing how this worked out. And some people have let it slip that this is the way it works. So any four. And so it's, Larry, when somebody says, I'm going to take this all the way to Supreme Court, well, <laughs> good luck. Good luck. I mean, there are 5 million lawsuits in the United States at least a year. Uh, 10,000 will eventually get appealed to the Supreme Court, and of those, about 80 will be rendered. Although during the Warren Court, they had up to 500 cases uh, 
that they would would be taking a year. Okay, let's, take, let's take it one step further. They, sure. they agree there's going to be a take a case. Sure. They have hearings. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's not just any lawyer can appeal, can argue before the Supreme Court. How do you become certified to argue before the Supreme Court? Well, you Court? have to apply for membership. Okay. And uh, and uh, and uh, it's very select people. Although they've had, they, there have been some people who are brand new, you know, newly minted attorneys. They get clobbered, however. Yeah. But um, but you have to be a member of the of the uh, of the bar uh, for for. Okay, the, so you get the case before the court. You yeah. have legal counsel argue it. Mm -hmm. The court recesses or adjourns to consider the case while they're still working on other cases. Yeah. So. How do they decide when they reach a consensus? Do they meet periodically as a as a group of justices, or do they work through intermediaries? How does that work? Oh, that's a good question. Um, the Supreme Court begins every term on the first Monday in October, and then they will meet for what they call sittings, two week sittings. They'll be on for two weeks. And off for two weeks, on for two weeks, off for two weeks, and they'll do this all the way up until they end the term, which is just before the Fourth of July. All right. So they will hear cases for two weeks. When I say that, that means they will hear oral arguments. That's where the they take the mandamus case. They say you can appear. So they hear cases from uh, from. 10 o'clock in the morning until noon on Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. 10 to noon, they take a break, an hour break. Then they come back and go from 1 to 3. On Monday and Tuesday, they take Wednesday afternoon off. On Wednesday afternoons, and, and, and but let's go back on this. When they have hearings, they call both sides in to give their, uh, their opinion. They each have half an hour. One case, you get an hour oral hearings. They get the the the, the plaintiff or depending the petitioner. Uh, you get one uh, one half hour, and there's a lighting system in the court. And there's a light when a yellow light goes on, and when the red light goes on, you're out. I'm done. Right. And you might be in the middle of. A, you can't finish the sentence. See, and then you could be interrupted. And and. Um, at any time. And they can ask you any question you could possibly, uh, they pepper them with questions. Now, Scalia was notorious. He would rapid fire questions. And if you weren't prepared, uh, you couldn't get it. Um, John Paul Stevens was a very gentleman. May I ask you this question? He would say, well, of course, you're the, you're a justice on the court. You ask can ask anyone. Uh, and then there, Clarence Thomas rarely ever ask a question. And he would simply rock back and forth. He still kind of still does. Once in a while, he'll ask some penetrating questions. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg would usually sit very stern and erect. And, um, and you know who did? You know who told me about this? John Roberts. I met with John Roberts one afternoon. This is before he's appointed a, a, a chief justice. Uh, I met with him at the Georgetown Law Center, and he was telling me he had he had appeared. He had argued fifty eight cases before the Supreme Court. 58. Uh, it was probably a, almost a record. And he'd won virtually every case. And he's told me how he learned to read their faces. I've got a little notes on that. I should publish it sometime. He you probably should. wouldn't like that. But uh, I actually have some witnesses to that. But, uh, the, but uh, they would ask questions. Now, uh, when their time is up, it's it. On Wednesday afternoons, they will meet in a conference room. And on Friday afternoons, they will meet in conference room. The only people who ever get in the conference room are the justices. I have been in the conference rooms, but no one ever gets in there when they're there. No clerks. No, 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 no. They they used to have, I don't know if they still do, they had a telephone and it only went to one place, right? And um, the room is not much bigger than this stage right here, right? Maybe a little bit bigger. And it's right off of the chief justice's office. And it's behind the main courtroom, right? And when you go in there, there's a table that's maybe three times bigger than this table right here, Larry. And around it, you have tablet paper, uh, or excuse me, legal pads legal and, and a pencil. And in the middle, you have a copy of the Constitution. And when they decide a case, 
Now, tradition has changed over the years somewhat. Rehnquist did it different. But here's the way it was normally done. The Chief Justice presides. And then summarizes the case. That gives a lot of power to the Chief Justice, how he summarizes the court. There have been 14, only 14 Chief Justices. And when they summarize it, then they go and they ask the opinion of the most of the most junior member of the court. What do you think about it? All right. And it goes around. All right. And then, uh, oh, excuse me, they ask the, the most senior. I'm sorry, the most senior. And it goes around to the most junior. But when they vote, they reverse it. So the pressure is all on the young ones. So I Kavanaugh, I would imagine, or anybody who's just added to the court has a lot of pressure because they've heard the other people talk. So they vote orally? Uh, or are yeah, they doing a, yeah, on a no, they, paper? they vote in the, uh, now the, the tradition is they come in, they shake hands mm -hmm. and they sit down and then the chief justice might uh, talk about some uh, administrative things like maybe when Larry Balsamo was chair, I don't know how you operated the, uh, I, uh, with the iron fist, I'm sure. Yeah, we are. Uh, yeah. But any uh, the chair of the Department of History. But anyway, you come in and you have, the, they're your colleagues, right? But uh, when they vote, uh, if, uh, if they vote f five to four, something like that, uh, nine to nothing, if the chief justice is in the majority, he writes the opinion. If he's not in the majority, it goes to the most senior member of the opposite of the people who voted the majority, right? And oftentimes, and here's the power of the Chief Justice, Larry, and I think you know this, but if the Chief Justice doesn't like the way it turned out, he can vote with the majority so that he can write the opinion and water it down, or he picks somebody in the, in the majority whose opinion is more like his. That's the power of the Chief Justice. So to, to say that they're not very powerful is not true. They, they can control a lot by, the, by virtue of the fact that they, they call that. Do the justices, while they're considering a case, talk to each other informally? They sometimes will. Uh, I would today, they would probably maybe email. I don't even know if they trust the email. Yeah. But they had a phone system. They had their own phone system they could put in that supposedly couldn't be tapped into. But I think they would uh, move around a little bit. I mean, their offices are, are, are fairly located, fairly close together, very nice offices, but they're located fairly close together. And there is uh, some cajoling that goes on. Now, as I said, you hear two cases for two weeks, and then you're off for two weeks where you write the decisions. See? And that's where they rely, and more and more they rely upon law clerks. That's why the decisions are getting more lo or longer. And with the advent of computers, See, yeah. they, you don't have to go to the law library and look up every case. You, they, you can just cut and paste and add your, and they become very long. And then they circulate those. And they may tweak them. And they may um, uh, may disagree uh, before they finally come out with the, the decision. And so two weeks on, two weeks off, two weeks on, two weeks on. But I would say the most contentious cases are always at the end. They wait till they, they'll, they'll make an announcement if they're in session. They'll make the announcement on Monday morning, or a uh, or a Tuesday morning, actually, or a Wednesday morning when they're in session. If they're not in session, they're on the two weeks. They'll make and they come up with a decision. They'll announce it usually on a Wednesday, maybe even a Friday, right? And uh, so that's where everybody's listening. What did they say? And um, you can't always tell what the court case is by the headlines on the on the sure. newspapers. So this procedure. Yes. Is it time honored? Does it start with the early chief justices or did it Oh, that's a great question. Time? All right. In the early days of the Republic, um, they had seriatim opinions. Each justice wrote their own opinion, his or his own opinion. I say his, I, I'd like to say her, but they're yeah. until, they're until, uh, and, until Sandra Day O'Connor yeah. uh, in the eighties, we did they all only meant, but um, uh, they wrote seriatim opinions. So you had a decision, you got six different opinions. Well, what does that mean? Nobody exactly knew, right? It didn't land clarity. That's the beauty of John Marshall. He came in and said, we're going to have opinion by the majority. And we're going to have one person speaking for the majority. And that's what they did. Incidentally, if you have a tie, 
And, and that was a terrible idea to have six members on the court. Sure. It was a, why they came up with that, Larry, I don't know. Six members of the court, because inevitably, the, if there's a tie, then the lower court decision stands. And that's the way it is today. But, uh, but uh, it's, um, to, so when John Marshall changed that immensely, he changed that. And uh, he was, um, he, he was really a brilliant politician. And he didn't care much about his looks. He, he had frumpled hair. He was tall, about six foot three, uh, kind of lanky, a uh, very uh, deep voice. And uh, he just didn't care much about that. Uh, some of the other justices were prom and, you know, prim and proper. And when, uh, when your Roger B. Tawney got on the court, he said, we need to wear knee bit riches, right? And look, uh, look the part. And so he restored knee britches to the court. But uh, that was, uh, long pants is what, uh, is what Marshall went with. Marshall was also, I think, Jefferson's cousin. Well, that's an interesting case. I mean, um, almost everybody in Virginia's cousin, I know. But I, No, but, no, here's a tidbit that maybe you don't even know, okay? And if, and if you know it, I wouldn't be surprised, all right? Jefferson and, uh, and John Marshall were bitter political enemies. They didn't like each other. And you're absolutely right, they were cousins. Maybe a couple times removed. Yeah. And um, nobody, you know, they always said, well, why is it he dislikes him so much? Well, do you know why? Her name is Eli uh, Eliza Ambler. Eliza Ambler. Eliza Ambler was engaged to Thomas Jefferson. It was his first love. They were engaged to be married. And he, the wedding was called, could you imagine this? A wedding, Charlene creating a wedding. And all of a sudden, the bride, the groom doesn't show up. He stiffed her at the at the altar. He didn't show up. Thomas Jefferson didn't. St he he did not come. All right. He did. He just rode the other way. Right. Well, Liza Ambler hated him, and his the family hated him. Liza Ambler is was John Marshall's mother-in-law. You see it? Yep. And those things run deep. I don't care how you say it; they run deep. And there was no love between them, right? So, uh, so Mar Marshall is the first important chief justice. Oh yeah, yeah. And he sets the courts, the Supreme Court, more or less on a kind of nationalist position. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah, he was of a nationalist position. He says that the Constitution means something, and that he overrode a lot of state Supreme Court justices. Uh, one of them was Spencer Rowan from uh, from Virginia, who says you have no authority. To hear an appeal from a state Supreme Court, we're the final authority, and um, it, that was that was um, um, uh, Martin versus Lessee, right? And John Marshall looked at this as, if it involves a federal question, that involves a treaty that you're trying to make it. a ruling on, and therefore we call we can trump you on that. So they did, and Spencer Rowan says uh, you can't do that. You have no authority, and he said, you know, this Constitution was created by the states. Spencer Rowan argued. And that we have the right to uh, abide by those decisions or not. Marshall didn't write back to him, but Justice, uh, Justice um, Story wrote back to him. He says, this Constitution says, we the people of the United States. It doesn't say we the states. We the people. And But uh, Spencer Rohn um, got his comeuppance. But his voice was picked up later by none other than John C. Calhoun. The nullification theory. Nullification. Yeah. And so that ultimately was the thread that started uh, very early on. But he was a nationalist position. And government uh, has to be strong enough to maintain itself. And, and you've got to give him that power. He was very strong on that. And uh, Larry, he wrote 700 decisions. Uh, when he took over, he was a fairly young person on the court. And the rest of them were getting pretty feeble. And they didn't want to write. So he did it. So he volunteered. So he was either on the majority or he he took probably on hundreds of other cases. He had his fingerprints all over it. He was a very profound person. And we wouldn't have the justice. Sue, question? Anything? Nope. What, what does he mean? Just take your mask off. It's been said that others, other other than the strain of the Dred Scott decision, Tammy was one of the best chief justices. Do you agree? 
Okay, it's Tawny, first of all. I know it's spelled Taney, yeah. but he pronounced it Tawny. But there is a, a county in Missouri called Taney County. Yes, there right? is. So, but it, Tawny, T-A-N-E-Y. Yeah. yeah. Um, who, by the way, was married to the sister, of, no, the daughter of Francis, Francis Scott, Scott Key. Key. Yeah. He wrote the, uh, his Texas. best friend was Francis Scott Key. Francis Scott Key, yeah. right. Okay, let's look. Um, I I would not pick Tawny as the, as the greatest Chief Justice. He was influential. Uh, he was in, very influential. Uh, and for your que the question, or uh, they're right, he was very influential, but maybe in a negative sense. Yeah. yeah. Let's look at Dred Scott versus Sanford. Would, yeah, you so you're, say, you're, would you agree that's maybe one of the two or three worst decisions ever made? Oh, absolutely. Court? Absolutely. Um, it's a complicated case, as you know. Yep. Uh, when Missouri came into the Union, um, they were pressing, you know, St. Louis had slavery. grown tremendously, and they wanted to become a state. And uh, the problem was there were equal number of, Demo uh, of slave states and non-slave non states. So in the Senate, there was a tie. If you made Missouri a free state, it would tip the balance to the north. And if you made Missouri a slave state, it would tip the balance to the south. So a compromise was reached, and you take the state of Massachusetts, and you break it up into the state of Maine. Maine was originally part of Massachusetts. So Maine came in as a free state. Missouri came in as a slave state. Okay, so we have that. What happens is Dred Scott is a man of color, born into slavery in circa 1795. We don't know because he kept good sure. records. You know. Born in Virginia. In Virginia. And his master, his name was Peter Blau, or Blow, some would say. And he took him, he was an army captain, and he took him and his family to St. Louis because he was stationed. When he got there, he died. And he was sold to a Dr. Emerson, who was a physician in the U.S. Army. Emerson now owned Dred Scott. He then was stationed to go to Rock Island, which is a free state. Illinois. In Illinois. And then he went up to Fort Snelling, which is near Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul. Which is free because Free territory under the, under the Missouri, Missouri Compromise. Compromise right? Okay, we'll go back a second. The Missouri Compromise also drew a line in the Louisiana Purchase. Yeah which is the southern border of Missouri, above that line, 3630, you could, in, the, mm -hmm. in the territorial stage, it's free. And below that, it can be slave. Right. All right. right. So when, when Emerson took Dred Scott, um, not just for a visit, they sojourned at Fort Snelling up in oh, Minneapolis, yeah. uh, Minnesota. He was in territory freed by an act of Congress. Exactly. Okay? So he gets back and to St. Louis and Emerson dies. And he's, he's, he's bequeathed to his, his wife, to his wife, Irene Emerson, and she doesn't like St. Louis. She says, this is the wilderness. I want to go back to New York City, where I'm from. So she gives Dred Scott over to the original, the brothers, the kids of the Peter Blau, the original owner. They loved him. He was like a family member. One was a prominent attorney, Larry, and the other had owned a railroad. Owned a railroad. Yep. They were wealthy beyond, and they were abolitionists. So they, they could have manumitted him at any time. They could have said, you're free. But they set up a case. So they brought up a lawsuit against Irene Emerson, and they sued her in a Missouri court that the very fact, by dint of the fact that she had gone, he had gone into a free territory and a free state makes him free. So they went to the court, the, the state court, state court, and they won. And then it was appealed to the Missouri Supreme Court, and they reversed it. And that case, by the way, is still in Missouri Supreme Court. I used to take my students there, and you can see it in case. It's handwritten. It was called Dred Scott, a man of color versus Emerson. Well, they were going to appeal that to Supreme Court, but there was another case called Terminus. It was called Graham versus Strader. It was a case out of Kentucky where a man in Kentucky contracted to do work in Ohio, a free state, and he took his slaves with him. The slaves tried to bring a lawsuit saying they were free, by, and the court says, no, we can't do that. So... They had to come up with a new strategy. So they, uh, they, it was a collusive lawsuit. Irene Emerson sold Dred Scott then to her brother from New York. That creates a diversity case and gets it into a federal court. And you have to change it. So they called it a trespass. He trespassed against him. That was the argument. It gets to the Supreme Court. Now, Tawny looks at this, and he could have just dismissed it and says, you have no standing to bring a lawsuit. He did do that. He says... A people of color were not citizens when the Constitution was written. Therefore, you have no standing to bring a lawsuit. He could have ended right there. But no, 
Tawney wasn't content with this. He ends up writing a 57-page letter uh, uh, in which he goes on and says, and by the way, Congress, you have no authority to eliminate slavery in, this, in any state or territory. You have no authority under the Constitution to do that because it violates the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment says that the federal government cannot take away anyone's yep. right to life, liberty, or property. Now, in this case, Dred Scott was property. And that's substantive due process, isn't it? Yeah, they would later call it substantive, substantive due, process. due process. That would be Field that comes up with that title. But um, they, uh, it was a terrible decision. And it goes to show, Larry, that the Supreme Court couldn't resolve the slavery issue. It couldn't be resolved in Congress. A bitter fight over it, as you know. Uh, uh, it just couldn't be resolved. It would lead to that major conflagration called the Civil War, which the, is you're the authority the on The process that Dred Scott went through started in 1846 and ended in 1857. Yeah, it's an 11-year it yeah. journey. 11 years, yeah. And you might want to know that after that, Dred Scott was freed and lived in St. Louis under the supervision of the county sheriff, and he died about a year later. Yeah, he, he was a he was a porter at a, uh, a yeah, local hotel. A local hotel. And uh, but he was a, a, there could be a great. I've always thought about writing a play about this, you know, or a movie about the, yeah, the Dred Scott issue because there's so many twists and turns in it. As a fabulous case, but uh, Roger B. Tawney, the only way you overturn that is with the constitutional amendment. And for the person who called in and asked the question, uh, ultimately we have it in 1868. It's called the Fourteenth Amendment. And the 14th Amendment begins, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and Our subject citizens. to jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and the states where they reside, and no state shall deny anyone privileges, immunities, equal protection, or due process of law. The 14th Amendment was created because of Dred Scott. If you're born in the United States, you're an American citizen. But it also creates a problem even today with immigration. Yeah. Uh, a pregnant woman comes across the border has a baby, the baby is an American citizen. What do you do with the mother? I We still don't know what to do here. Yeah. You could, it's, it, it's a really, it, it's tied us up in knots. But the 14th Amendment is a direct result of Dred Scott. And so the Dred Scott decision was really in effect not very long. Um, it was rendered in 1857. It's nullified by the Civil Rights, Civil War Amendments because slavery ended and then you become citizens, so it doesn't last very long. So you, I would agree that's a terrible decision. Tawney went on and on. In those days, they read the opinion out loud. Now, they was a, I mean, it was like I heard 32 or 37 double-columned pages that he wrote. N now they don't read the decisions aloud, do they? No. No, they... I was in the court, I was in Supreme Court when uh, in, in 2000, when a case called U.S. versus Dickerson, it was the first major challenge to the Miranda ruling. And um, it's just a good background. Um, you have the right to remain silent. Everything you say can mm -hmm. will be used against you. And um, but uh, in that decision, most people don't know this. Everybody says, well, I know the Miranda rule. No, you don't. Uh, what Justice Earl Warren says, until such time as Congress shall put down the rules, Police officers shall say until such time. Well, in 1968, Congress did pass down the rules it's called the Ominous Crime Control Act, and they said, "Here's what you can do, and you don't, and you get a ride around Miranda." But it was never enforced. Mm -hmm. It never got enforced. Nixon got in trouble with the with Watergate. It just got buried. All right, nobody looked at it. Well, in night in the year 2000, in the Dickerson case, they tried to use that and say, "No, we're going to use the." We're going to use the uh, Omnibus Crime Control Act because this is what says the guy the guidelines are in regard to telling your rights. Well, I suspected uh, Miranda, uh, uh, Redquist hated Miranda. He abhorred Miranda. So he was chief justice, and I was at, studying at the Georgetown Law Center. And so we got to go in, and we sat in the front rows. Uh, well, behind, I had to sit behind Alan Dershowitz, all right? He, he came in with his bushy hair at that time, right? <laughs> and I had to go like this, uh, uh, looking around him because he kept moving around. But when they came in, and by the way, when you go in that courtroom, it's about um, uh, 60 by 80 feet and 44 foot with 28 columns around, and it's quiet as a church mouth. I mean, you've got to be so quiet when you walk in there. You've got to be reverent. And then all of a sudden, the the uh, marshal gets up and says, "Oh ye, oh ye, oh ye! All ye having business with the court are admonished to draw near." 
for the chief justice and associate justice are in court, right? And then he says, and God saved this honorable court. Notice how they, they use the word God in there. Mm -hmm. And then they have to rule on the on school prayers, all right? Well, anyway, so Rehnquist comes through. He comes through the middle, first the, in order. Three come in the middle and through these big velvet robe uh, drapes, right? And then two, on, three on the side, and they sit down. And you sit down. And I thought he was going to kill Miranda. And you know what he did? He looked out at the audience. He says, you have the right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney. Anything you say can now and will be, well, right then it killed. You see, the, the, the precedents mean something, right? Precedents. Um, that's the power of the court. And you know, I forgot where we were going with this question. It's okay. Uh, it's, it's a, it, okay. Okay. Caroline, do you ever have? Okay. okay so this, it, we would agree, is a terrible decision. Oh, yeah. Is it worse than Plessy versus Ferguson? Well, Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, keep in mind that the 14th Amendment would seem to give um, everybody, would seem to give equal protection. It was intended to give black people, newly freed black people, equal rights with white people, right? Uh, it never came about, as you well know. And uh, there, were, everybody looks to Plessy versus Ferguson. That's not the case to look at. I wrote high school textbook, as you know, for years, for Houghton Mifflin. And I really wanted to tell the case of Pace versus Alabama, not Plessy versus Ferguson. But I couldn't get away with it in a high school textbook. Plus, Pace versus Alabama is where the state of Alabama says, if a white and a black engage in sexual relations uh, out of wedlock, all right, they call it adultery, let's say. The penalty was twice that if a white man and a white woman committed it or a black man and a black woman. People of the same race. Right. So the penalty for black-white is twice that of white-white or black-black. Well, that was in 1883, Pace versus Alabama. And when it got to the court, the court says it doesn't violate equal protection because it's equal discrimination. Equal discrimination. They both the black and the white, the black ma black man and white woman, got the same penalty. Richard um, Richard uh, Pace and Mary Cox, the two engaged, they got the same penalty. So it wasn't equal. That was equal discrimination. Well, that's why Plessy came about in essence. So you could separate the races as long as they were equal, right? Now that was a collusive lawsuit, by the way. Okay, well, hold on a second. Plus, yeah. he has to do with a state law in Louisiana, which required separate railroad coaches yeah. for people traveling on trains right. in the state of Louisiana, which the railroads hated. Oh, because yeah, they, were they, had to buy, they had to put on extra coaches. Yeah, it cost them a lot of money. It cost a lot of money. And, it, and in, in a, a person who was what, one eighth black, Plessy, mm -hmm. was, was part of a deliberate lawsuit put up by people who supported him. Uh, and they the, knew his background and they they set him up so he would be arrested. Right, exactly. And 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 Ferguson was the presiding local judge, the justice of the peace or whatever they called him. And you know what's strange about that? He sued a judge. Yeah. Right. You don't sue judges. You sue they them. have they you they have the their state. own way of doing things. They have called judicial immunity. You never sue a judge because the court will never rule, even if the judge messes up. Um, uh, the judge doesn't get sued because they said if a judge got sued for every decision he or she made, it would the whole system would collapse. Now there's there's an element to it. so he gets sued and they challenge and of course when it gets to the court it was a um, it was a, an eight to one decision and the lone dissent was John Marshall Harlan. John Marshall Harlan he says you know the Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor condones and we will never overcome this decision this day. It was, a, it was a horrendous decision. Now, the reason I think it's a terrible decision is because it its effects lasted into the 1960s and 70s. You had segregation in public places, sanctioned by the court under the doctrine of separate but equal. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and so you had a segregation what, a champion supported by the Supreme Court of the United oh, States. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and the uh, interesting, the Mar John Marshall Harlan was the only dissenter. You're right. You know who that wrote the decision on that? It's ironic. His name was Henry Brown. Henry Brown. Brown 
the case that overturns that is Brown versus the Board of Education. A little yeah. irony on that. Maybe. Is it? Well, John Marshall Harlan was a native of Kentucky. His family had been slaveholders. Oh, yeah. He fought, he fought for the Union during the war, but he opposed the Emancipation Proclamation, yeah. which brings me to a, a point we can look at. Yeah. You can never predict what a justice or a chief justice is going to turn out when they become justices or chief justices. You're absolutely right. In fact, uh, studies have revealed that fully one fourth of all chief just of all justices, not just chief justices, of all justices, have failed to live up to the expectations of the presidents who appointed them. them. Yeah. Uh, for example, um, John Kennedy was particularly upset over uh, Byron White. Uh, Byron White. Byron Wizard White, the only guy who played professional football, yep. right? Uh, an All-American football player, in Colorado. And he was totally disappointed that he was too moderate, in some cases more conservative on the court. Um, well, you know Eisenhower had no idea what Earl Warren was going to be when he appointed him Chief Justice. No, his biggest mistake was, guess who? Brennan. Yeah, well, yes. Now, Brennan... Uh, Brennan uh, he, 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 most people don't know how this occurred, but when Brendan was appointed, Eisenhower was running for re-election, and he had a vacancy on the court, and he said, you know what, I want to show that I'm magnanimous, so I want, I want a Democrat, I'm going to appoint a Democrat. He says, also, I want a Catholic on the court, because I, I really need the Catholic vote, right? And third, he says, I don't want anybody who's ever been a politician. I want anybody who has been in Congress. I don't want anybody who's ever run for anything partisan office. So he sent his people out there to find the person. And they happened to go to a luncheon. And the luncheon that day is none other than making the speech is, is William J. Brennan. Brennan gives a remarkable conservative speech. They say, what party is he? He's a Democrat. Oh, he is. What's his what's his uh, what's his uh, uh, religious fellow? He's Catholic. So they went back to Eisenhower and said, "We found the perfect person. His name is William J. Brennan." Well, they didn't do their homework because the person who was supposed to make that speech was the Chief Justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, his name of uh, the New Jersey Supreme Court, and his name was Hughes. No relation to uh, Charles, Evans. Charles Evans Hughes. But he got sick that day and asked. He asked Brennan to read his speech, right? So he ends up with the most liberal activist justice who has ever been on the court, and that is William J. Rehnquist. Isn't that amazing? William J. Brennan. Uh, Brennan. Well, who, and, who, who could predict what kind of justice Hugo Black was going to be, for example? He'd been a member of the Klan in the he Alabama had been a of Klan, although he Now, he, would he ever get uh, through the... Uh, not the now. Senate Judiciary Committee, no, not right? now. But he was a loyalist to uh, Eisenhower, or not uh, uh, to Franklin Ro Roosevelt during the New Deal. And um, now, by the way, here's a man. Hugo Black is a fascinating individual. Uh, he always carried a copy of the Constitution, un not unlike what you had yep. in here, was tattered and tear worn, care worn. And uh, he always claimed that he was a judicial restrainist, but he was far from that. He was far from it. He interpreted things like the Establishment Clause in Everson case as to what freedom of religion means. He relied upon a historian who was a bad historian to come up with the stuff on that. His idea about Establishment Clause, his idea about incorporating the 14th Amendment and the original meaning of the 14th Amendment, he was so far off base, and yet what he came out with, for example, everybody's heard this, Larry, it was in 1947 where he says, there's a wall of separation between church and state. There's not said that in the Constitution. It's not said, in the Con it's not stated. That was something he brought in as a quotation from Thomas Jefferson in a private letter that he sent to the Danbury Baptist in 1801 after he left office. And today everybody says, well, separation of church and state. Well, this is because... Hugo Black went and put that quotation in his opinion, and it just stuck with us today. All it, all the council says is that Congress will establish no religion. That's, well, oh, that's yeah. all it boils well, down to. Let's think about this. When when they met in Philadelphia, in Philadelphia to craft this new constitution, most people don't realize this, but nine by the time of the Declaration of Independence, nine of the 13 states had established state religions. 
It was the Anglican Church in Virginia, Virginia. right, and to some parts of, of New York. The Baptist Church had become the, the state church in, in the Carolinas, right? Um, you have the Congregational Church was the established state church in Massachusetts, Massachusetts. and Connecticut. Yeah. So when you come together, you say, well, we're going to have an established state church. Established state church meant you taxed the people to support the church. And you required people to go to church. And you could discriminate against people who are non-believers. So what happened was when they met in Philadelphia, they said, this thing will fall apart. So what we have to do is place in there a provision in Article 6. And no religious test shall ever be required to hold public office in the United States. That's there. But that wasn't enough. Because when they went out for ratification, they said, we're so afraid that that the, the national government is going to interfere with the states. We put that in there. So the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. You know what that means? It means stay out of religion. Federal government, you stay out of that state. You stay out of that state. You don't get involved in it. Now, what happens? You go block comes and says, no. What it means is that neither the federal government or state government can set up a church, cannot tax a support a church, cannot get involved in church affairs or vice versa. There has to be a wall of separation. So he completely changed the meaning, maybe for the better, but he completely changed the meaning of the Establishment Clause. And it got to the point where under Black and others, that anybody could bring a lawsuit, all you had to do is show that the government's involved in religion. That's why I have all these lawsuits all the time all against them. cities, because they don't have to prove intent. They just simply say, you're involved. Now, the, the by the way, the recent Supreme Court has tried to draw back on that. Uh, a little anecdote. I had Justice Scalia in my class at the University of Missouri. He was a guest in my class. And he simply said, Hugo Black was so wrong on so many decisions. Hugo Black would be the first to say that he is a judicial restraint. He believes what's in it. But his interpretation has created judicial activism, the like of which Brennan went right, you know, hook, line, sinker with. If you're going to keep dropping names, I'm going to have to mention that I, I played basketball with Abraham Lincoln in high school. Okay? Well, <laughs> I, I have to tell you something. Do you know what's on the top floor of the U.S. Supreme Court building? Uh, the basketball court. It is. Yeah. The, most people don't know that. But on the top floor of the Supreme Court building is a full-length basketball court. And uh, it's literally and figuratively, Larry, the highest court in the land. Yes, right? Oh, and, oh, oh. And I actually got to go shoot hoops up there, right? I could say I shot hoops. Now, the only other person who was shooting hoops in those days was Clarence Thomas. Uh, the law clerks do it. All the but, time, uh, I'm sure. But they had to change things when uh, when Senator Dale Conner came. the old whole complexion of the thing sure. because of co-rec. But well, uh, it's an amazing place. I mean, when you think of the Warren Court, yeah. and he was Chief Justice 16 years, yeah. obviously you think about Brown versus Board of Education, but Warren, I am told by you, I think, thought another decision was the most important one. Which one was that? Well, uh, when, when he retired, they asked him what the most important, everybody thought it would be Miranda versus Arizona or Brown versus Board of Education. I mean, that would be the first thing that would come to my mind. That's what I would have picked. He said, Without hesitation, as quick as a hiccup, he said the most important decision was Baker versus Carr, 1962, the reapportionment case. Uh, up till that time, uh, every 10 years you have a census under the Constitution. And then you count how many people are out there. And by the way, not just citizens, whoever is living there, all right, who is ever living there. And it's for purposes of representation in Congress. Uh, it, it, Congress now has 435 members. It's been set that way since 1911. There's nothing magical about 435 members. Do you know why they kept it at 435? Because there are no more seats, <laughs> right? You, they, you can't get any more seats in there. So they kept it at 400. So it's like a balloon. You keep the same amount, but as people change, as states grow, the balloon changes. Right? It's still the same amount of air in there. But you change it. Go, so we saw New York growing. Now it's losing. Um, if you went back to 1900, uh, Florida had just six members of the of the uh, six members of the electoral college. That's four senator, two senators, and four members of Congress. Well, what is it now? It's, it's probably going to be about thirty some members after the next census. Yeah. Texas, Texas only had uh, eight. Uh, excuse me. California only had eight members of eight members. Right, six members of Congress. They've got 55 members now, right? So it changes. 
But what happened was that as the population changed, they didn't change the districts. And there was a case out of Illinois in 1947 called Cold Grove versus Green, in which the state of Illinois had failed to redistrict the congressional offices since 1900. And so as a result, it was a nine to one imbalance. Cook County had nine times the population of the county here, of the district here. So a lawsuit was brought in 1947. Kenneth Colgrove, a professor of political science at Northwestern, sued Kenneth uh, Green, who was the governor of Illinois, saying it violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Supreme Court looked at it and says, ah, nah, that's a political question. We're not going to get involved in politics. We lead up the state legislature's life. Well, it went on until 1962. Brennan is the key here, right? And it had to do with the reapportionment in Tennessee, the state legislature. You had four metropolitan areas, uh, Memphis, Nashville, Chattanooga, Chattanooga, and Knoxville. Knoxville. And they had grown in population, but they never gained representation. So as a result, it was something like a 41 to 1, 43 to 1 imbalance. And so a lawsuit was brought by the governor, actually the, the mayor of Nashville, Against um, uh, against the Secretary of State, claiming it violated the Fourteenth Amendment equal protection, and the Supreme Court agreed. Well, that opened up the door. So thereafter, lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit, and today, you wonder why our votes don't count very much here in in, in McDonough County compared to Chicago. It's that lawsuit, all right? Because it it says urban areas have to be given representation equal to the number of people they have. It's, it's probably the only fair way to do it, but it was, he says, that had the greatest impact on anything. It's had a great impact on elections today. It's had a, 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 an impact on roads and bridges and social services and education. Everything you can think of. A, a, honestly, yeah, Larry, that, that was, was a major case. And so a lot of people were surprised by that case, but he says that was the most important decision they ever handed down. It was a very activist, but it was one probably necessary. Do you think there's much of a chance of the Supreme Court changing numbers being enlarged? Well, uh, uh, the Democrats are in control now. They could give it a try. There'll be an awful, uh, even Roosevelt had com- control of both houses of Congress and most state legislatures. And he had the White House and he was arguably the most in- influential president we've ever had, really. I mean, get elected four times. Didn't make it through the last one, but uh, he couldn't get it through his court packing plan to to raise it up, because Congress yeah. didn't go for it, right? Congress didn't. No, it, you're right. Congress didn't go for it. Uh, yes, thanks, an act of Congress and the presidential signature to do it. Um, well, it would take um, it would take Congress. Congress has the authority to change the size of the Supreme Court anytime it wants to. Yep. It's not. It's it. It's really Congress's. The um, well, maybe or maybe not. It's never been tested. It's like a Supreme Court, uh, like constitutional amendments. Uh, some constitutional amendments early on, the president signed, and then there were some that he did sign, and it went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says it make any difference. It doesn't make any difference because it simply says Congress decides, right? So I'm not sure if that's a great question to ask whether or not that would well. I mean, be consider, required. I mean, Roosevelt made this proposal right after he gets reelected in 1936, and then I think he carried every state but Maine and Vermont. It's a huge victory, a huge mandate, and he can get con- and he's got oh, virtually veto-proof majorities in each house. Absolutely, and he can't get either house well, to go. Well, don't forget it. what happened in 1938. In 1938, he looked at all the Democrats out there in his party, and he says, "I'm going to get rid of Millard Tidings from Maryland, Walter George, yeah, and I want to get rid of Cotton Ed Smith from South Carolina." He says they're not voting for my policies, so he put up his own people against him. And you know what happened? Lost. Everybody he singled out won. He was re-elected. Yeah, everybody he got reelected. And so there was a little bit you could see that you can't you can't mess around too much with local politics. You're all politics local. It sure but is. he was powerful and he couldn't get across. Now Biden, Biden's got so many things on his plate right now. I don't see how uh, it, are you going to waste uh, any capital you have on that and, you, and get defeated. I think they'll do this, and they always do this. They'll appoint a commission to look at it. To look into it. Now, there have been some political scientists who have argued this, and most of the political scientists are Democrats, by the way, um, and uh, one of which was uh, Larry Sabato of uh, 
University of Virginia, Virginia. Yeah. The renowned. And he says, no, the, uh, he says, that's one way to improve the, improve the uh, United States. I mean, uh, improve the representation is to, is to have a reflection, a true reflection. Now, if you have a true reflection, I mean, how are you going to have this? By the way, uh, there, it took years and years. The first Catholic on the court was um, Roger. R Roger B. Roger B. Tawny yeah, was Tawny the first was Catholic. Catholic yes. right. And the only reason they left him on there is because he was 64 and they thought he wasn't going to live very long. He ends up being there 27 years. But the first Catholic. Now, today, um, I think huh? I think there are six. Yeah, six. Yeah. And uh, and two Jewish and one, I think, the, the last uh Amy Coney Beck. No, she's Catholic. She went to Notre Dame. Clarence Thomas has got Clarence Thomas accepted. is Catholic. He converted. Yeah, yeah. He was Baptist. He convert. Yeah, he was converted. Uh, and the first the first Jewish justice was uh, um Brandeis. Louis Brandeis. And, and, by Roosevelt. and they had a hell no Wilson. And they had a Wilson, hell, of, yeah. hell of a fight yeah, sorry. over that. Not only was he a kind of a judicial reform, but he was Jewish in nineteen sixteen. I Did mean, you know was, that that uh, when when they built the Supreme Court building. That's an interesting thing. That was built in 1935. Amazing. Uh, but they had no permanent place before that. They did uh, settle in the old Senate building for yep. a while. And then they had, were in the old uh, Senate uh, uh, hearing room number two for many years. And before that, they they were in apartment buildings. They were in hotel buildings. They just met wherever they could. Basement of the Capitol. Basement so. of the Capitol, yeah. And, um, and, and so when they built the new building, uh, Brandeis didn't feel like he was wanted there because um, uh, Bradley, Joseph Bradley, wouldn't sit next to him. And there was another one. Uh, uh, what's his name? Because, uh, Mc, um, I'm, I'm tapped out. You got me. Okay. There, uh, a couple of justices wouldn't. Even, they wouldn't even be, have their picture taken with him. They didn't want to be in the same room with him. They were so prejudiced. And so, uh, yeah, he felt that, and he never kept an office there. He he came he he came to work and then he left to go back to another office. That that's how bad it was. Right now, uh, and recently we've had uh, much as four three three uh, Jewish people on the court. Yep. Um, so um, things have changed. Things have changed, and and it should you know ideally it should be a microcosm. What well, I've heard the, the talk, and I've heard Clarence Thomas and I think Sc uh, Alito and maybe Scalia described as originalists. There's variations of that too. Okay, what what does that mean? Does that means the original language of the founding fathers of the Constitution. Well, there's some variations. Or they mean it would come under the umbrella of judicial restraint. Uh, you don't want to create new law. And mm -hmm. by the way, one thing Justice uh, Scalia mentioned in my con law classes: don't ever use the word "living constitution" next to him. He said that's those are those are awful things. It's not a living document. It means something. It was written. Now. Scalia was a textualist. He says, read the words That's of the it. word I'm looking for. He was a textualist. Read the words. What do the words mean in, and what they meant in those days? Um, Thomas would say, let's look at maybe the original intent a little bit. And let's look at the meaning behind it and, uh, and how it originated. Now, let's take an example. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title VII, prohibits discrimination based on gender it was never intended. It was for race, right? And when it got to the desk of, of um, uh, when it was created, uh, they got so much opposition by the Southerners, they added the word gender, no discrimination based on sex, because they wanted to kill the amendment. They wanted to kill the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Because the year before, there was an Equal Pay Act that came up, and they looked at all the people who voted it down, and they said, we got the majority. So all we have to do is add this, which was the Equal Pay Act, inside the Title VII, and, kill and we're going to kill the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Well, instead it passed by two-thirds vote. Now, so we don't apply this until the early 19, well, early, late 60s, we start applying the gender in regard to discrimination under the, the Civil Rights Act of 64. What is the intent of the people who wrote it, right? What is the intent? The intent of the people who added that was to kill the civil rights. They had no idea. They didn't want gendered equality. Now, so a textualist would read, look at it, and say, it says gender. Apply gender. Now, what, what Scalia said, and, and, and you would have Kavanaugh probably saying the same thing, and I would imagine Gorsuch. 
and maybe even Amy Coney Barrett. If you don't like what's in the Constitution, then organize people and amend it. You have the freedom to amend the Constitution anytime you want to. If you don't like the Constitution and the way we interpret it, then amend it. And point in fact, we've had it amended four times to overcome adverse Supreme Court decisions. And it could be done, but it's difficult to do. In this day and age, to get three fourths of the state legislature, two thirds of both the House, both houses, two thirds of both houses of Congress, good luck on that one, Larry. So and three fourths of the states, it's virtually impossible. When you talk about textualism, yeah. do they mean the Constitution as originally written, including the first 10 amendments, but not including the next 17 or all the amendments? Are textual. You, you you take the words with the this, amendments. This is do. the most difficult thing in, in constitutional law to talk about. The Bill of Rights was amended, was added to appease the opposition to the Constitution. Sure. And it was a, a restriction on the national government, not the states. And the first 10 amendments, First Amendment, Free of Speech, Press, and Second Amendment, the right to keep the third amendment, quartering a soldier, fourth amendment, search and seizure, etc. Those amendments were only applied to the national government. And it wasn't until the 14th Amendment, it gets interpreted by the Supreme Court beginning in 1935, that on a case-by-case-by-case-by-case-by-case basis, that part of the Bill of Rights becomes absorbed through the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Today, not all the Bill of Rights applies to the states. Did you know the last one to apply to the states? wasn't until a year, uh, it was, was, two, uh, it was uh, in, 19, uh, in 19, uh, 2010 came out of Chicago, the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment only prescribed, prohibited the federal government from regulating your guns, not the states. Supreme Court changed that, and who interpreted that? Guess who? Scalia. Scalia. Wasn't that kind of an activist part on his? Yep. All right? You see, that terms make hypocrites out of everybody on that court. Everybody's a hypocrite, because nobody can be consistently the same on all things. It, it, it changes, times change, and people interpret things differently. We we all we here even tonight mostly focused on what chief justices do. But in your study of the court, yeah, are there outstanding individual justices like Brandeis or John Marshall Harlan or somebody like that that you could highlight? Let me let me uh, let me highlight one. Okay, uh, Harlan Fist Stone. He's the only justice to sit on every single seat coming up. He, and he became, and by the way, he was a Republican appointed by Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt. Right? Which is only one of two people ever appointed by the opposite, in, from the opposite party. The other one was Edward White appointed by uh, William Howard Taft, yeah, right? right? A Republican. But Harlan Fiststone, in 1938, there was a case. Um, it was called U.S. versus Caroline Products. Most people don't know that. You hardly ever study it. It was a case whether you can adulterate milk. Right. And whether you can uh, up to that point, freedom and liberty was thought to be contract freedom and freedom of property. Property rights and contracts were the most important rights protected under the Constitution until 1938. In the most famous footnote ever written in American history, footnote number four, he says, you know what? There ought to be protection against individual liberty for uh, for individuals and protecting against them. He changed it to start changing it. And he says, you know what? There are some classifications that are suspect. Among those are race. If you pass a law that distinguishes between people of race, he says, that should immediately raise a red flag to judges, and it should be a suspect classification. And the burden of proof is on the government to show why it should discriminate on the basis of race. Well, today, the test the court used is this, and I'll just highlight it. Anytime the legislature, just to highlight, and this is how it works today. Anytime the legislature of Illinois passes a law, or the Congress, or the Macomb City Council, or student government of the University of uh, Western Illinois, whenever they pass a law or a rule, it's presumed to be constitutional. It's presumed to be constitutional by the courts if it is rational. It's a rational basis test. What does rational mean? It means that it's reasonable. It means that it is tightly drawn and narrowly applied to a, to a legitimate governmental function. I'll give you an example. Um, 
If the state legislature passed a law today that says people with blue eyes can no longer drive cars in Illinois, the court would say that's irrational. That's not reasonable. Why? Because there's no relation between eye color and the ability to drive a car. Or if Macomb City Council put a one mile an hour speed limit through the city, the court would say that's unreasonable. It's just irrational. But if the Supreme Court said no child, no one under 13 can ride a motorcycle larger than 200, uh, no, no, no larger than 1,000 cc's, the court would say that's, that's legitimate. It's regional. So they use an ordinary test. If you want to challenge anybody, if you want to challenge anybody, any group, individual, wants to challenge a law passed by the state legislature, the burden of proof is on you to show that it's unconstitutional. But if it involves a fundamental right, and the government passes a law that restricts a fundamental right, then the burden is on government to justify it. And the courts will begin with that. Now, what is the fundamental right? There's no definitive list, Larry, but it would include the freedom of speech, the right to an attorney, the right to peacefully protest. And if government restricts that, it's presumed to be unconstitutional. Now, here's where Harlan Fist Oak comes in. The suspect classification. He says if it deals with nationality or with, or with um, race. Anytime you pass a law that distinguishes between people on account of race, it's presumed to be unconstitutional from the very beginning. And the heavy, heavy, heaviest burden and strict scrutiny comes under government. That's Harlan Fist Stone that came up with this. It was brilliant. It's brilliant. Um, it is with us today in sure. every aspect. Uh, however, different groups want to come up with it. Uh, for example, age discrimination. Many people, the AARP says, you know, age should be a suspect classification. If you make a distinction based on age, it should be a suspect classification and declared unconstitutional. Now, the court says it's reasonable because we slow down and you don't, you want a hundred year old pilot uh, on a, on a 737 uh, piloting. No, I don't think so. there are things that happen. There's, and the same thing with certain disabilities. People want disabilities to be a suspect classification. No, there is a reason why we have uh, laws to protect people. And uh, gay rights, they want that to be a suspect classification, to say it's automatically suspect if you make the distinction. Women, the gender, the women's rights movement has long tried to make this a suspect classification. If you did, then you'd have men and women in the prison together. You'd have unisex uh, restrooms all over. I mean, they say there is a reason why you have distinction between men and women. There are, so women come under heightened scrutiny in between st strict scrutiny and in... Now, that's Harlan Fist Stone that comes up with this. It's brilliant. And that footnote is now with us today. And it's the precursor to when judges start making a ruling, they say, what do we start with? Is If we start with that this is a... If we start with that this is a rational basis for the government, they're going to presume it's con the law is constitutional. If they find that you are taking away a right, that's why all these voting rights cases have come up in regard to mail-in voting and all that, because they've used, they started with what? The fundamental rights test. It's a fascinating topic. I'd say Harlan Fisto. There are others. We got one. You got a question? Or a quick we... comment. Yeah. says, this has been great. Huh. Reminds me of the fun part of law school. So we're about out of time, gentlemen. Let me give you one more brief question. Sure. Of the three new justices appointed. Yeah. Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Barrett. Yeah. Which one do you think will surprise us? They'll all surprise us at one time or another. Uh, I don't know. You can predict right now exactly because they're still tied in their mind to that vitriolic and acerbic process they went through sure. uh, in, in, the, in the judicial um, uh, uh, committee. committee. And I think they're still a little bit scarred by it. And I think they're pulling away from it. You know, any challenge that was made in regard to the election and how it was counted and all that, they avoided that like the plague. Sure. All right. Uh, that's judicial uh, restraint when it came to that. You can almost see that one coming, though, too. But they also, you know, it, it's like when somebody changed their mind in regard to the flag salute cases, 1940 flag salute case, mm -hmm. um, where they said a, stool, a school can compel you to salute the flag. In 1943, they changed their mind entirely. And by the way, in 40, you know how they saluted the flag in 1940? 
it looked like Heil Hitler, right? Yeah. So he changed that. And it were identical cases. It was one of the great reversals. 1940, uh, Gobitis case to change it in West Virginia versus Barnett. And several justices changed. There were some new come on the court, such as Justice Roberts, or uh, Justice uh, Jackson. Um, Jackson. Yeah, thank you. Um, but uh, two of them changed their mind. And somebody says, did they reread the Constitution? No, but they read the newspapers, right? They read the newspapers. So I think that public opinion, I don't care what they say, it has an impact on their human beings. Sure. And, and some of them are going to surprise you. Okay, I think we're done tonight. Rick, thank you very much. It's been most enlightening. Back, I told you the time to go fast. I, I enjoyed, the, I enjoyed the, the, the give and take. And good night to all of you out there. Thank you very much, Sue. Thank you, everybody. See you in two weeks. Yep, March 3rd. Thank you.